Um, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you so much for taking the time. Um, we really appreciate it, the SBDC, you taking time out to uh, listen to this webinar today. Um, I think we put together uh, an interesting webinar for you uh, on the subject of IP. And um, we're looking forward to um, spending this time with you and answering some of your questions during the Q&A. Like Harolyn mentioned, um, I'm gonna start with the first presentation, which is gonna uh, orientate around uh, IP, what it is, what it isn't, the different types of IP, et cetera, at a very high level. And then, uh, fortunately, we uh, have uh, our partner from um, Burr Foreman um, Lawyer Company in Greenville, um, Doug Limebury, who's a patent lawyer. Um, I've worked with him um, professionally, and uh, he's uh, an excellent resource to, uh, that helps small businesses with their IP from strategy right through to implementation and management post uh, receiving and the grant of the patent. And uh, we're very fortunate and thank uh, Doug for his time and, and the, for this outreach to the wider community. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share the presentation. So let me put that out. Let me put that on and let me share and let me go to full screen. And maybe Carolyn, it, once it goes to full screen, you can just let me know that everybody can see it okay. It is there. And that is there. And I just need to go back to the beginning. Okay, folks, so we'll get going. I'll put my timer on. Um, this will run uh, around 45 minutes, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of question and answer. If I get through faster, then we can all get back to work or go home faster. So that will be great. Um, so time is on and I'll begin. So this uh, um, webinar is, is uh, 10 common mistakes that make you cry. So we thought we'd have some fun with this, but it's actually not fun if you uh, mess up with uh, your IP, with its strategy or its implementation or its management uh, through its life cycle. So um, we talked about, I will talk about IP generally and then uh, really, Doug comes in and starts to talk about the heartache he receives personally and some pointers that can help people, prevent people from making similar mistakes. Um, just a short kind of advertisement. There will be a follow-up IP, and you can uh, note it down, uh, which is a different perspective. I'll be with Elizabeth Doherty from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and her and her team will be coming on really talking more about what the USPTO can do to help uh, small businesses and entrepreneurs and inventors, and uh, but also look at good practices and what they see come in um, that are mistakes and cause heartache again to the, um, to the um, inventor themselves. So it's really about um, going from a good patent to a great patent and uh, maximizing the chances that you won't be knocked back and uh, you will have a strong patent. So that is on December the 1st, um, 1 till 2.30 p.m. You can find the link on the SBDC website or at the end here, you'll have my information. Just reach out to me and I'll send you a link. So just a, a, a short advertisement again, just about the SBDC. Um, hopefully most of you folks know about the SBDC. But we are a, a resource to South Carolina that offers um, free consulting and um, educational programs and funding resources for small businesses. And um, we have different programs uh, from business planning right through to um, helping you um, with your, your uh, fiscal management um, and many other parts of re the requirements you need to actually run your business. Um, from my perspective, one of the things we offer is technology commercialization support for tech-based companies, as this is an IP webinar. Uh, there might be more uh, uh, small businesses within that space. 
and um, what uh, I, I do is basically concentrate on um, the development process, technology development, product development, which is on the left hand side of this screen, doing that in a stage gate using stage gate methodology. So really figuring out how to develop a product. And then on the right hand side, also talk about how you might get funded um, through federal grants like SBIR, STTR or more state funding and private funding, like through SC Launch and VCs like Venture South. So I help companies um, fund their developments. So that's what the tech commercialization offices does uh, within the um, small business development centers. For more information on that, you can just reach out to SC SBDC and you can find out more what we do on our website. So advertisements done. Let's get into the topic itself and just start with uh, what is intellectual property. Um, so tackling this, I think um, one way to describe IP is a set of non-physical assets, um, which are typically not found on a company's balance sheet, that protect an inventor uh, from the use of that IP. Um, from competitors and uh, other people uh, for a given period and uh, it's non-use without their consent. So if you give the consent and you own the IP, uh, others can use it, but you control it. So you control your own IP. And the IP is broken up. Uh, the three main categories you will find are uh, trademarks, patents, and copyrights, but there's other types of IP too, uh, uh, licenses and also trade secrets, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute on another slide. And um, the US Patent and Trademark Office called the USPTO, they are the granting or federal granting organization. So they register patents and trademarks and they are located in Alexandria. And um, for copyright, um, that is done through the Library of Congress in downtown Washington, and the US Copyright Office uh, registers and administers uh, copyright um, through their website and through that office over there. So just a few little bit of geeky moments, I guess, but um, the intellectual property is a right, and it was built into the uh, Constitution by the founding fathers under Article 1, Section A, 8, Clause 8. And um, this was uh, written into the Constitution and signed by George Washington on April the 10th, 1790. And it was designed to promote science and the arts. And the first uh, patent reviewer was actually uh, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, he was the first reviewer. Um, so it is a constitutional right to patent and to protect your IP. Um, the first patent was issued to Samuel Hopkins on the 31st of July, 1790. So a few months after um, the uh, patent was written into the constitution. And it was for the methods for producing potash and pearl ash, uh, which is a potassium carbonate for those in the chemical business that was used for soaps and glass and other kinds of products at that time. And uh, so that was the first one. You could see it's uh, X00001. So that's patent number one. And uh, another interesting fact, or maybe not interesting, is that the only president to ever own a patent is Abraham Lincoln. And he, that was granted in 1849. And that was to float a small boat that he owned and had problems getting over shoals. So he made some bellows and put them over the side and blew them up or was able to float his boat and got a patent for that. So um, that boat can be seen or the proof of concept can be seen um, in uh, Washington, D.C. at the uh, Smithsonian uh, Institute over there. So um, I'm sure you're all excited to have known that. OK, so what are the uh, we talked about the three main uh, types of IP and they are trademarks, <clears throat> copyright and uh, and patents. 
So for the trademarks, um, they typically cover uh, some kind of phrase or word or design. So think about, you know, the um, Coca-Cola, the brand, or the McDonald's Arches, and uh, they are all um, trademarks. And um, trademarks are, are typically, um, you will see a trademark with a TM or an R next to it in the top right-hand corner. And they both have slightly different meanings, and I'll talk about them in the following slide. Um, so there's also copyright that covers more than just words, phrases or designs. It's more a, a total uh, artistic piece of work, um, like a book, a novel, some music, a movie, photographs, paintings and things like that. And um, they are covered typically by the symbol C in a circle. And then the main part, so this is 95% of all IP that's actually registered are patents. And um, I'm sorry, uh, within the patent part, 95% of all the patents that are registered are utility patents. There are some design patents put out there, about 5% of them, and a small amount of uh, what are called plant patents. So... I'll go through those. So a plant pattern is essentially for a new kind of um, organic so plant. So think about a kind of drought resistant wheat plant or something like that. Um, you may be able to get a, a plant patent based on that specific um, plant itself. Um, then you have a, a design uh, patent, which might be something like the Coca-Cola bottle, the, the, the twirly bottle of Coca-Cola, um, or a, a Disney character like uh, Minnie Mouse, they will have uh, design patents. And then you have a utility patent, which is more a technology-based patent, um, which is typically a kind of article, uh, a machine, or some kind of composition of matter, like a new drug or a new chemical. So um, within the patent part, three types of patents, and uh, all of those come under the kind of uh, IP umbrella. So beyond uh, patents and um, the trademarks and copyright, there are there is IP that is not registered and um, we call these trade secrets and trade secret makes up a really large part of many companies value. And these, this is typically kind of sensitive to company and proprietary processes or uh, information. Um, so it, it could be, for example, a cookie mix. Um, the classic of course is the um, Coca-Cola um, uh, the mix for Coca-Cola itself is one of the best kept trade secrets been kept for a long time and uh, it's kept in a vault and locked down and uh, um, nobody's ever been able to copy it exactly. And you can imagine how much that's worth to the, the, the company. So um, these are all trade secrets and the three basic parts that um, make up a trade secret. The one is it must contain some kind of uh, information, um, some valuable information. The second, um, if that information became valuable to a competitor, it could damage the company or it would be very valuable to that competitor or other user of that information. And the third is that the company owning the trade secret has to demonstrate that it's taking, making certain efforts to keep that information secret. And um, for example, I worked for Millikan and Company. So if you ever pass Millikan Company in Spartanburg, you'll notice that there's no windows in any of the manufacturing facilities. And that's because Roger Millikan never wanted anybody to poke the nose through the window and figure out how, what their processes were and what machinery they had inside. So there was a purpose for having no windows. Um, so, you know, if keeping the information separate and away from prying eyes or locking it away are ways that you demonstrate that your trade secret has been protected. And anybody 
who misappropriately um, takes that or finds that information um, can be uh, litigated. And um, so trade secrets are important. And um, I would just mention that this part, and I might go over it again a bit later. So why wouldn't you just trade secret? The problem with trade secrets um, the good part is it is that they're, they're cheap, they're relatively easy to maintain. And, and um, so it's a cost effective way of, of keeping something secret. On the downside, anybody could just come up with a similar idea and just make it and compete against you. And, um, you know, a product that you make could also be re-engineered and there's nothing you can do about it. So compared to a patent where you have absolute coverage for the period of time, um, that's not the case with a trade secret. Um, other people can make exactly the same product if they really desire to. Nevertheless, there's a lot of trade secret and it's an extremely valuable piece of IP. So let's delve down into those three uh, areas of IP we discussed in a couple of slides ago. The first was trademark. So basically a trademark protects a brand, a logo, a symbol, uh, or phrases, um, even designs, and it protects them from competitors. So the idea of a trademark is to prevent confusion <clears throat> to the marketplace. So it proves that you have a consistent, dependable, trustworthy product uh, like Heinz tomato, tomato ketchup would be a good uh, um, uh, example of a word mark, a word trademark in that case. And um, other example is, for, for example, Nike, where you have the word Nike, you have the swoosh as a logo, and you have the just do it as a phrase. So very valuable trademarks and um, important piece, pieces of IP that prevents competitors from copying it and leveraging your brand through, the, through a, a equivalent trademark. So why then register trademark? Because you don't have to actually register your uh, trademark, but it's a good practice. So this is the difference between a TM and the R. So uh, if you um, put a logo and you make a logo for your company, um, you can just send it out on your website or on literature or, or on social media and just put a TM next to it. And it's telling people that um, you believe this is a proprietary um, trademark for, for your particular company. And you can just do that. Um, however, and then that is covered by common law. So within the local region, so if you're a small restaurant, you call yourself uh, Kevin's Pizza and you put KP on it or something and you send that out there, that's fine in your locality. But even outside of your just your basic locality, let's say it's Spartanburg, it may have a lot less use. I'll ask Doug just to clarify this later, um, but it's got a very uh, localized um, use. After that, if somebody has KP Pizza or happens to have something similar in a, in a town nearby, they can use it and there's not much you can do in terms of stopping them from using it. So the way to get around that is to move from the TM to the registered trademark, which is the R in the circle. And to do that, you do need to go through the USPTO and register your trademark over there. And it costs um, some money to do that. It's about somewhere between 225, 275 to do the basic registration, plus any kind of uh, tra um, trademark patent lawyers costs or anybody that might help you to put that trademark together. Um, however, what that does then is it um, defines and registers federally that you have registered your trademark and gives you coverage should somebody try to get that trademark and use it anywhere else within the United States. So you get um, state cover, full state cover, and not just localized cover, plus you get all states cover if you register your trademark. So um, if you feel you're going to expand outside the local town or your local high street, 
then you might want to register your trademark. There, are, there is a state trademark, but also that doesn't give you full state coverage. It's a bit cheaper than USBTO, but the USBTO would be way to go. And think about it. If you don't register your trademark and somebody does register the same or similar trademark, then you may have to cease using what you would feel was your own trademark. So registering your trademark is not only valuable, it's worth more than $80 billion to Coca-Cola. The second piece we talked about on the main three parts legs of the IP is copyright. Copyright's somewhat similar to trademark in that you don't have to uh, register any copyright. If you do a work of art and uh, you, you, you write a piece of poetry, a novel, put some music together, um, by putting a small C and putting the publication date in your name, close to where that piece of um, artwork is gives you um, basic uh, copyright rights. Um, examples of that are in books, songs, movies, and any other kinds of works of art. And this is inexpensive, uh, but registering it gives you, again, like trademarks, a lot more um, coverage, especially if you're going to be litig uh, if if you need to litigate to somebody if you if you don't register your cop a copyright it's a lot more difficult to actually litigate and stop somebody from using your works without you authorizing that so really for the cost of doing a copyright which is quite cheap i think it's 45 or 50 dollars to do a a, a a basic registration uh, with the um, copyright office plus any fees uh, for helping with a copyright lawyer if you if you need to do that and some other fees but it doesn't cost a lot for having that security that you can actually litigate if somebody tries to copy or use your work without your authorize or authorizing them to do that um i didn't mention before but uh, trademarks uh, last for as long as the trademark is used for copyright um, it lasts for 70 years after the original author's uh, death, or if it's a for hire work, which means you've done a piece which belongs to your company, you've been asked to do it by another organization, so it's for hire, then that's protected for 95 years after publication or 120 years after its creation. But normally you yourself don't own that piece of copyright. It's owned by the the company or organization that's hired you to actually um, produce that copyright. So that's copyright. And then let's go on to patents. Like I mentioned before, within the all the IP space, 95% of patents uh, are um, utility patents. And that's the most complicated of the three patent areas. But I'll break them down so that you learn a little bit about plans and a little bit about design patents as well. So um, a patent is essentially uh, a license given to the holder on an exclusive basis based on um, either a new plant, a product design, or an invention uh, that has some kind of um, um, production mechanical side to it and an um, utility to that. So... Um, this I, these patent IPs last between uh, 15 and 20 years, depending on the type of IP. And I'll go into that into the following slides. And the reason for patents is really to give that security that somebody who's going to spend money in developing an, a product can get a return on that investment over a um, long enough period of time to warrant that investment. And to do that, with doing that, Patents help promote um, the investment in new products, innovation that goes out to um, society and uh, industry. So this slide kind of summarizes, if you like, the three types of um, patents that are out there. So if we start 
Plant patents are only about 0.1% of all the uh, patents that are granted uh, annually. But there is a plant patent, and it is based on agriculture and, and, and plants. That's what, it, what, what its uh, scope is. And there are some rules. Um, so the plant must be uh, asexually reproducible. Um, so naturally bred through root cuttings, um, bulbs, or some kind of grafting and division of the original plant, or through somatic or cultured embryo cells, uh, which don't normally produce a new plant, but in, they can be cultured to produce a plant, but it has to come from the original plant and it has to come from um, normal cultivation as well. So that's and an example of that. The bottom there would be some kind of like drought resistant avocado, for example. They need a lot of water. So if somebody was to come one that needed less water and that's good for society um, and that could be uh, genetically or produced or reproduced somehow and modified it, um, it can uh, apply for a plant. Uh, patents. So these plant patents, like the utility patents, last 20 years. And they do, like the utility patent, uh, pa uh, patent they're quite detailed and require this um, complete uh, botanical description drawings and um, are quite involved. So um, that covers plants. The design patents are about 5% of all patents uh, who are, that are granted on an annual basis. And they, that really protects how a manufactured product itself looks. So it's more about the design. So at the bottom there, I give you an example um, of a toaster, but that's a retro toaster. So the guts of the toaster uh, could be somebody else's guts of the toaster, um, but they're just changing the form or the design of, of that product. It has less with the utility to do and more with its um, form and how it looks. So um, a design pattern lasts 15 years. It's relatively easy to draw up. It's more of a DIY product um, and they are cheap to file as well. So I, I, I'm not sure of the exact uh, cost. I think it's about 150 bucks but uh, Doug can correct me on that. And what's good about the design patents is no maintenance fee. So once you have the design patent for that 15 years, you pay once you get your design patents and you're good to go for 15 years. Those patents are also granted a lot faster than utility patents, typically between six and 12 months. And then the main patent space is in these utility patents. So they cover uh, much more detailed uh, utility and use and manufacture of a, a product um, such as composition of matter, um, a manufacturing process, um, a, a new machine, um, these kinds of um, really deep, tangible kind of uh, products um, that uh, and inventions around that. And um, the, the utility patent offers, offers very high protection. So if you, if you manage to get utility patent, it's going to give you 20 years of protection. Um, it's quite involved to, and especially if you're a novice, to write a patent and to do it properly. And that's why we need people like Doug, who are patent lawyers, who know um, the ins and outs of how of the process and what is really required and the levels of detail. So, you know, patents are so valuable. You might uh, seek professional advice on doing that. And um, it's, a, it, it's an expensive proposition, not only more expensive to, um, to file, but also the associated uh, support costs from lawyers and also the maintenance costs, which Doug will talk about a bit later. But um, there is a three and a half year, six or seven year, and an 11 and a half year um, reprocessing fee to maintain that patent. And if you don't pay, you lose. So I'm sure Doug will elaborate on that in more detail, and that will make you cry. So um, maintenance fees are one thing that one has to consider. And it can also take typically two to three years. And there might be a lot of to and froing between you and an examiner 
which is also costly, before they end up granting you the patent. That it will be just smooth, plain sailing is mm, probably unlikely. But if you do it well, it's more likely. So the difference between the design patent taking the toaster um, schematic there, an example is that, you know, the toaster inside might have a utility patent. So that's on its functionality, its springs, its heater elements, um, even the basis of being able to pop a toaster inside and out pop up, all those mechanisms and things on how it's used and how it's manufactured and its usefulness, all are aspects of the requirements of a utility patent. So we've talked a little bit about the patents and I'll summarize in my next slide, but for the moment, there is <clears throat> considerable steps uh, in uh, you have to take to get your IP. So starting at the top left there <clears throat> is really, if you're a company and deciding what to do, really decide whether a patent is right for you. It's, it's going to be somewhat expensive. You may have to maintain it. So um, what are you going to have that's so important that you need to patent it in the first place? So really think about before running to a patent is what you're going to do to really accelerate and, and, and protect your business. And are you going to be able to pay and maintain that patent over a period of time? Then the step two there is really, well, can I patent what I have? Right. So the, if you go onto the USPTO website, they talk about the seven step search strategy, um, which guides you through how to do a kind of DIY patent search. And it's it's quite involved. You can do it yourself. But again, that's why patent lawyers can help. They can do searches for you. And they're very detailed. And I'm sure um, Doug will touch on that a little bit later on. Um, but there are some basic criteria. You have to describe novelty, usefulness, and non-obviousness of your patent. And if you go on the USPTO website, you can understand in more detail, how do I know that my product is novel? How do I know that it's useful enough? And what does non-obvious mean? Um, so I'm not going to describe that today. You can find out more on the USPTO website and you have definitions on there. And that's one kind of eligibility, if you like, criteria for you doing your patent. Other parts are um, deciding which patent do you want. Do you want a design patent or do you want a utility patent, for example, because those two can play off each other or do you need both? OK, so, you know, if you're going to make an e-motorcycle, do you want to have it on some of the safety features, or do you want it on the electric motor system? But you also want it on the design and the look of a motor, the motorcycle as well. So you might want one or both in that case. Number four is just understanding your uh, application strategy. Uh, are you going to do it yourself? Figure all that out. Are you going to get some le um, legal support? And then, you know, um, am I going to be able to afford it? Do I know? Um, how I want to apply. Do I want, have I divulged any information already? Do I now want to do a provisional? Do I want to run uh, instead and go to a non-provisional uh, uh, and, and, and go the full hog up front? So there are advantages and I would recommend you study that and talk to your patent lawyer as well about what is your strategy of patenting, giving yourself as much time whilst having coverage to uh, understand your market and to make any changes uh, before you're spending money that um, and have changes that um, you may have to make at a later date. So um, just jumping towards the bottom of it, um, after you've um, submitted and you've got your um, and you've uh, you've submitted your patent, you will ultimately get a hopefully a notice of allowance and um, you will then uh, have your patent once you pay your issue fees. So notice of allowance is a great thing. You can basically go hurrah, you send your money in, and then your patent will be sent to you in this nice format with a nice uh, emblem on it and a red bow and uh, something to be proud of. Then starts also the fun part, the maintenance fees, which are plus minus around four, eight, and 12 years. So once you have a patent, you're going to have to maintain it. And I'm talking about a um, plant patent, uh, no, a utility patent, uh, from that perspective. Plum patents and design patents don't have any follow-on fees. 
So just to kind of bring it all together now, um, this is about 32 minutes, so just about a uh, few minutes longer. Um, if we look at the difference between patents, trademarks, and copyrights, uh, patents cover form, um, industrial design, uh, and inventions that are more complex and technically uh, oriented, let's say. And um, for utility patents, they go for 20 years. For design patents, they're 15 years. Plant patents are also 20 years. Um, for trademarks, um, they are more unique and show a company's brand and uh, define um, its product through a logo or uh, a piece of text um, or a, a word, like just do it. And um, they are as active as long as the trademark remains in use. So Coca-Cola has been, I think, more than 100 years. Um, and copyrights are really about uh, authorship and they will last 70 years after the author dies, or if you do a full hire for a company, they last 90 years or 125 years. We also talked about trade, the importance of trade secrets. And although they are a low cost or relatively low cost, effective and permanent way to protect sensitive information from competitors, they um, can be re-engineered and somebody can come up with a similar concept and just make it and there's not much you can do about stopping that. That means patents have a much stronger protection, um, but they do have a limit in time and they are more expensive to, to manage. On the trademark and copyright, you don't have to register it. But the problem is your level of protection if you don't register your trademark. Remember, you can put the TM and you can put the C on um, and get very limited protection. But really, um, if you want to build a brand and then invest in a company and you might be out of your just local high street or town, you should really think about getting um, proper registration through the USPTO or Copyright Office. There's a great resource out there at uspto.gov. And if you haven't been on there, it's fantastic. There is, they have tons of modules on trademarking. They talk about um, the patent process and there's a lot of good resources um, and videos around and general on the overall patent to orientate yourself with the patent process itself. That's the second link there. So if you go to that link, you can go directly on and do a 26 minute presentation on the whole basic patenting process and what a patent is. They do a really good job. Trademarking is excellent. It's done in a fun way. I can recommend it. And then uh, if you go on to the uh, copyright.gov, you can learn more about uh, copyright as well. I would close this part of the presentation by just saying generally, IP is extremely valuable and uh, it can be more valuable than the company's act companies' actual assets, um, but it's also complicated. And if this is important to your company and it's going to be an engine of the company, you should seek professional help. And that's why Doug's on here today. So just to close this part, and we'll take some Q&A in a couple of minutes, um, in just a minute or so, um, we are the SBDC. So um, there is some information in there on how to reach out to us. You can go on those links there. You can go on SESBDC and find us through there, or you can email me or call me on the link at the bottom of this slide. And we'll help you not just with IP, but with every facet of your uh, early business needs. So that's a wrap from me from this part, uh, 36 minutes. Um, so a little bit early. So we have some chance of Q&A. And once we've gone through that, um, we'll introduce you to Doug and he will take the reins. So we're ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I am going to combine two questions because they came from Heidi. Thank you, Heidi. Um, she asked, IP includes the company name? Yeah. And um, I'll ask Doug to jump in, but I, I will try from the beginning with. So your company name um, 
you want to register that company name probably. So uh, I understand it comes under the trademark part. And um, I think and it's that leads important. that leads to her next question, Kevin. Thank you. I investigated trademarking my business name and the cost was about $1,500 total for registration fees and lawyer fees. Is there any cost to this that's less? There's no way I'm going to answer that question, Heidi, but thank you, because I have Doug here, and Doug will give you a million reasons why it's great value to expect, but maybe you can tackle that question. Thanks for the questions, Heidi. In the meantime, and if anybody else has any questions, please put them in. Yes. So here's another question. What percentage of applications are granted after an initial rejection by a patent examiner? In other words, if your application is rejected on two or more occasions by a patent examiner, what are the odds you'll eventually be issued a patent? Yeah, I don't think it's great, but I'm going to put that over to Doug as well because he works with this these specific issues every day. So we've got two questions there, Doug. Uh, one is on um, why are lawyers so expensive, just paraphrasing it. And the other thing is... Um, um, what have you seen as a success rate? Because I know that you help companies through the process when they are rejected. And no, Kevin, if you would like to stop sharing your screen, that would probably be helpful. I will do that. Thank you. And Heidi, great question on the cost. You know, I, you said you'd seen some place that said, hey, 1500 will get you, I, I think you said through registration. It depends. I mean, honestly, it really depends on what your search is at the beginning. I actually do give SPDC folks a break on this. Uh, foremost, I want to tell you, you know, thank you, Miss Strange, for keeping us on track. But everybody, also thank you for using the SPDC. I mean, people like Kevin, you just don't appreciate how lucky you are. Uh, I'm sitting down here in Columbia today. Uh, one of Kevin's counterparts, Alan Brown, was at my earlier presentation. And I'll let y'all know that you're doing a really smart thing by taking advantage of this resource. But Heidi, directly to your question, um, yeah, 1500 is not crazy. Uh, usually I'll charge an SBDC person 850 because I'm on the uh, full disclosure. I'm on the state board. I love the SBDC. I volunteer. I'm at a board meeting for them tomorrow. I love the SBDC. So take everything I say with that great big chip on my shoulder. But that's not crazy for that. The one thing I would tell you to do is use an attorney. And I know it's an attorney saying use an attorney. Here's why. Um, one thing that we'll talk about in my session and we talk about now is that after six and a half years, there's a major drop off in trademarks. By that, I mean, we will see all of these marks registered. After six and a half years, you'll see that they go from live to dead. What that means is that someone did not pay a fee at the trademark office. While that seems silly, uh, you know, paying your registration fee and them giving you a flat fee for it, you know, register, that's awesome. But that's not the end. That's barely the beginning because like, um, you know, you guys heard Kevin talking about the trademark for Coca-Cola and his trade secrets. You know, those have been going on 100 years now. Guys, trademarks are perpetual as long as you're using them. Problem is, Heidi, is once these guys get you registered, most of these companies have this cool little thing called your own, your own. And uh, they'll send you a letter and they'll be like, hey, got your mark. You're awesome. I don't know about you guys. I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. I'm definitely not going to remember 10 years out in the future that I need to renew a trademark. Uh, but y'all test me on this. Go check out the trademark website. You'll see, if you look on a bunch of dead marks, you'll see that almost, uh, it's just, it's amazing how coincidental it is. And it's not a coincidence at all. But after about six and a half years, they all die because you renew your trademarks for the first time between the fifth and sixth year. You've got a six month, uh, basically grace period that you can pay to get that done. But Heidi, I hear you. You see that price. You're like, this is awesome. Soup to nuts. I'm done. They're not done. If you're using a trademark, it is not done. You want to use a patent attorney or a trademark attorney with a docketing system. You want somebody that's going to ping you and say, hey, Heidi, you know, your renewal is coming up. Are you still using the mark? You're not bound to renew it, but you need someone to remind you so that you can look at it and see that you are doing it. Second question was, we've had a, uh, a basically an initial and a final rejection on a patent application. What does that mean with respect to chance to allowance? Um, I am going to posit back another question. Have you interviewed the case? You need to get on the horn with the patent examiner. If you've not gotten on a video interview or a phone interview, you're not really prosecuting your patent. You can, be, you can have paper tiger wars with examiners all, all the time. Uh, as you guys will see, I'm not like the typical patent attorney. I am gregarious. I love to go out there. I love to play with y'all. I love questions. A lot of uh, my brothers and sisters really are paper warriors. You know, they like to fight on paper. 
at the patent office, if you really want to move something forward, you personalize it. You get on a phone call with the examiner. You have your attorney on there with you. You know, Kevin talked about self-help in a couple instances. I'll tell you this. Don't follow your own trademarks. Do not follow your own patents. That's not self-help. That's self-harm. Somebody will have to come back and dig you out of that, and it might be too late for the damage that's already been done. You need to seek an attorney for both of those. Uh, University of North Carolina has a great article that says that uh, trademark applicants are 50% more likely to get allowed with an attorney. Uh, patents go off the scale compared to that. Very few of uh, the self-help patents ever go very far. You'll see that they're an application number. They're very seldom ever a patent. You do have some skilled artisans who are familiar with patents, have started out working with an attorney in the past, and have now handled so many patents that they're pretty good at it on their own. Those guys are the vast exception to the rule. Uh, I will tell you, though, after two rejections, if you've not interviewed that case, you need to. You're currently under final. Uh, there's some cool things you can do. There's times you can ask to be interviewed. Um, but again, don't view it as a, this thing's dead. Sometimes it takes a while. Um, it also depends on how important is this uh, patent to your company. You know, if it's important to get something out of it, you file a request for continued examination and you keep fighting. Um, you can also try different packs, you know, call that examiner, do an interview. Um, that is a great way to see what the examiner's thinking. I mean, guys, I've had uh, examiners come straight out and say, look, you've got a neat technology, but I know I can hit you at every turn. I've had examiners go so far as, you know, working with a client, fighting the fight to say, you know, here's what we've got. We've got a situation to where, um, you know, we're going to address this issue and this issue, 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 issue. And what will happen is the examiner will come out and say, reference one. Oh, wait, well, new claim. Well, here's a reference two. And I've had them go up to six or seven before. And if you hit an examiner like that, you may have to appeal the case. Uh, if you're convinced that you have a great thing that I am novel, the examiner's being unreasonable, go ahead and appeal it. But sometimes, too, take a step back, look at that patent application and say, wait, am I fighting a pyrrhic victory? You know, am I sitting here and I'm going to get something either so minusculely narrow that it won't be any good? Or am I fighting a fight for something just simply a pyrrhic victory in the sense of, I'm never going to win it. I keep throwing money down this thing, and we can spend that money someplace else. Um, Heidi, I'm reading your comment that just popped up. Yes, that's exactly what I was told by the lawyer I found, even though he was a patent trademark attorney. Thank you for the info, and if you're available, would love to talk. Absolutely. Happy to help you guys. Um, I will throw my phone number in here for you, Pat. Uh, Heidi, feel free to call me whenever you want to. And all of you guys here, please feel free to call. Um, initial disclosures are free. I do not charge for a consult for SPDC folks. I would rather you guys be informed and know what's going on than make guesses and things go wrong in that aspect of it. Um, at this moment, do you guys want me to head into my presentation, Kevin, or what are we doing? Yeah, I would just <clears throat> I would just say that um, this whole um, patent space, there's so many landmines and it's complicated that just listening to what Doug just said, it frightens me <laughs> to heck. But I'm just a, a guy off the street. So um, that's why. And uh, so it's not for everybody. But um, having that kind of help and knowing how that works and talking about how you can be narrowed down and just this insight you gave, Doug, was uh, enlightening, uh, scary, but enlightening. So um, thanks for doing that. And with that, um, Doug, um, if you share the screen at the bottom, um, you can take the reins. Uh, we're at one uh, fifty three. So we're scheduled to finish in an hour, but um, let's uh, go through it and um, see where the time takes us. Absolutely. Guys, I was asking a really quick question from William Clark, asking if I could recommend somebody to help design a logo. Absolutely can. Um, feel free. I'm putting my number out here, y'all. This is my office direct line. Come straight to me. If I'm not there, leave me a voicemail on it. I'll be happy to return a call. But on that point, I'm going to jump on to our share screen, and we're going to start learning about things that will make us cry. Uh, Kevin, can you see the PowerPoint? Does it look good? I can. Yes, sir. The full screen. Thank you, Miss Strange. Thank you, Kevin. All right, guys. This is what we want to avoid. And you're like, oh, Doug, my God. can you put it on full screen, please, instead of seeing the tiles to the left? I am so sorry. Let's see if I can. Let's Th see here. Let's see. How is, bear with me, Caroline. I'm trying. Does that one still show the uh, tiles? There you go. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so guys, this is what we want to avoid. Uh, we want to make certain that we're not crying baby thinking, oh my gosh, what went wrong. Now, as part of this, you know, I get the Halloween's already gone, but I'm going to tell you stories that'll make you cry. Uh, these are little IP horror stories. 
Uh, here's the first one. You know, Heidi said, hey, I've spoken to an attorney about a trademark. Heidi, that's a damn good beginning, my dear. That's awesome. Now, what I want y'all to do is to understand that the reason she did that was to avoid a lot of these issues. Um, one thing that I help clients with a lot is we will get cease and desist letters from other companies going, hey, your mark is too similar to my mark. The vast majority of the time, that's not the case. And this is just somebody trying to be um, to overly enforce a mark, a little zealous enforcement, if you'll put it that way. I uh, just had one from Dave and Buster's for a client. They were trying to enforce their little logo, uh, eat, drink, and play. I had a uh, client with an entirely different trademark, but it also had eat, play, drink as a very, very minor tagline into it. And so um, Dave and Buster's came out and said, hey, we're going to do this. Problem is, we done a good search beforehand. Uh, we knew that we were clear. Dave and Buster's came out after we were in the opposition period, meaning that we got through the uh, trademark examiner. Everything was good. Clients using the mark. We uh, provided a specimen in use. We're in this 30-day window. Here comes Dave and Buster saying, hey, your mark's too much like mine. Well, unfortunately for Dave and Buster's, that's not the case. Uh, we've got several really, really good arguments against them, one of which being that this eat, drink, play that they like so much is a very, very commonly used mark. It's very weak. Um, that is something that we developed with skill, something that we develop after being able to look at trademarks for a while to understand them. But we need to make certain that we ne never put the cart before the horse here. Before we start using our trademarks in a website, signage, brochure, social media, anything along those lines, do a clearance search. By that, I mean you go on the USPTO, you go to TESS as Trademark Electronic Search System. And I guess I could just show you guys. I'm going to stop share for a second. You will scream at me because I know I'll goof it up. Uh, we're going to share screen again. Let's see. I guess I need to actually pull up a website excerpt. You'll bear with me one second. What I'm going to do is pull up uh, one of our websites here. And I'm going to show you all exactly how I'm going to do it. I'm going to share screen with you guys. We're going to do a share screen and to let you guys basically see how I would do this to show y'all just as a way of being safe with this respect to all of you guys. How do we do this? How do we do this search? So I can y'all of y'all see now a uh, basically a search page? Kevin, Carolyn, can y'all see that? Hey gang. Assuming you guys can hear me, I'm not certain what's going on. Now, this is the part we want to go to, Dan. The basic word mark search. We'd like to go here. We would like to put in our name and search it. And we'll just say trademark name. We're going to do a live and dead search to see what's out there. We will search this to see what's out there. You'll see the trademark, this name, Whiskey Road, et cetera. But that is a rough way to start. And that's how I want you guys to do this. I want you to be very critical. I want you to go in and look at your mark. And again, that was USPTO, trademark electronic search engine. And then you type in your words and search. Once you get past that, you're good to go. Because then, you know, hey, I can reach out to an attorney and say, look, I've done an initial look here. And I'm not seeing anything that's uh, too similar to my mark. Can you, dear attorney, tell me if that's okay or not? Now, we should be back on our screen share and uh, back on our slide. But to understand this, make certain that we do that search first. That is the biggest hurdle we have to overcome. If we will handle that, we will be off to the races with respect to having a healthy trademark. Just doing that search, making certain that we're out there. Also, if we see marks we don't like, or marks that we don't think are being used in commerce, we've got some offensive um, opportunities against them as well. Uh, we can do what is called an opposition to their trademark, or we can cancel them. Uh, this allows us to be able to go after um, their marks to be able to cancel them as marks to actually make it easier for our marks to be used. Tears of the next order, we didn't obtain an assignment. Now, you guys heard Kevin talk about patents several times. He did a really good job of setting out what's out there, you know, what's to be expected, et cetera. And really what we want to do here is to understand that patents are property. And it's just like, you know, I can hold up my phone here. It's just like a piece of property like the phones. It can be sold. It can be transferred. It can be licensed. It can be leased, essentially. What I want y'all to know, though, is that you have to make certain that your company owns it. If your company does not own the patent, you have a problem. And 
And by problem, I mean, guess what? We now don't own this piece of property that we thought we did. And so what I want us to know is, hey, did we go out to these inventors? Did we go out to these copyright authors? Did we obtain those assignments? You know, I could ask everybody here today, do you have a logo? A few of y'all will raise a hand and I will follow up with the question of, have you obtained a copyright assignment from your author? And you'll be like, what? Why would I do that? I paid them money. Here's the problem. It's a work of art. It is a logo for you. And of course you think it's a work of art, but it literally is a work of art. It's a copyright. And we have to make certain that we have got this done in such a way that your company owns it. No guessing, no hypothecation, no assuming. We have to have an assignment from that author, whether it's for software, whether it's for a logo, whether it's for a website, whatever you want your company to use, we have to assume it comes to you. Also, I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy. If you have an employee working for you, you know, you heard Kevin talk earlier about work made for hire. You know, pure work made for hire is very, very seldomly occurred. Um, they're based on nine specific types of works. Unless you're an atlas maker or a test drafter, probably not going to fall in there. The other type is an employee acting within the scope of her employment. That is very cool because if you've got somebody hired to be a software drafter, those works immediately come to you. They do flow to you through the work made for hire doctrine. However, belt and suspenders, it's a fashion risk, but we're going to pull it off. I want all of you to get an assignment as well because guess what? Let's say it's a graphic designer who comes up with a new software and you're like, well, I'll pay you to make things. You don't necessarily pay them to create software code. And so we need to be very careful with this. You know, if it falls squarely within their duties, sure, let's run with that protection. But what I don't want to do, I'm going, I'm getting through that. Oh, I'm sorry, Heidi. Hey, guys, apparently y'all are having trouble hearing me. Caroline, can you hear me? Maybe what Heidi's talking about, Doug, it's a little bit kind of um, muted, and not muted, but muffled, let's say. Well, Is sorry, that... I'll move. Does it help, Kevin, if I move closer to the computer? Yes, definitely. Awesome. I, I might have been leaning back. My fault, gang. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to talk point blank into it. Thank you all for letting me know. Keep that up throughout the presentation. And Heidi says it's better on her end. But, y'all, what I really want to do is to make certain that you guys are safe. Assignments, assignments, assignments. I want them for your logos. I want them for your patent inventions. I want them for everything from you guys. We're going to over-document because I'd rather have a document than not have a document. Um, can you force, oh, uh, Prelo, awesome question. Can you force a sign if there is a refusal? If it is an employee in the scope of their duties, yes, you can. There's actually a mechanism for this for patents. There's a form we fill out to say, hey, we have a non-cooperative inventor. This should go to Prelo's company, Prelo Inc., just for uh, sake of naming it. And guess what? Mr. Smith refused to sign it. So yes, Prelo, there are ways that we can force that. What I would tell you is to get it early. Uh, when I work with clients, especially if I work with a client that is a company that has personal inventors, I have those inventors sign the assignments when we file the initial application. You have some attorneys who are like, oh, we can come back and get it later. No, get it now. Because as everybody knows, memories fade, people leave. You get those assignments on hand for patents, for inventions, for whatever they may be at the time you're creating them. Lord forbid you don't get this, whatever the product is, gets successful and takes off. Well, now you've got an inventor who's maybe uber inclined not to assign thinking, hey, I can haggle for more money. I can have the ability for this to be partly owned by me because here's the rub. If the inventor actually is an inventor in the true sense of the words, if we allow a patent to issue in their individual name, they would own it. We do not want to do that. We want it to issue in the name of the company and have assignments from the individual inventors to the company. But Prelo, you're right. You can't force that if somebody tries to balk up on you. Tears of the third order. Now, this is one of the greatest comedic geniuses of our time, Mr. Bean. Um, I will tell you all not to be Mr. Bean. Do not copy things off the internet. Do not take text. Don't take images. Don't take sounds. Don't take videos. I don't want you using somebody else's tagline or their logos without permission. I do not want you mimicking the appearance of somebody else's website or their products. I know that the internet makes it so easy, guys, just to go and put something on there, to create a good website, or to create a product that you may send out to someone. But I want you to be very, very, very careful doing this. I would admonish you not to do it because guess what? If you take a text or images or sounds or a video, you're most likely a copyright infringer. If you're taking somebody else's mark or the taglines or the logos and you're putting them on your 
product or you're trying to use it to sort of glom on or get a little goodwill association from them, you can be a trademark infringer. If you take the way somebody's product looks, you know, if you start making something like a um, brown, colorful liquid that's sweet in a bottle shaped like a Coke bottle, you can get in trouble. So I want y'all to understand that just because it's out there and just because it might be attainable via the internet, it is not safe. I don't want you guys to consider it safe. I want you to consider it as damaged goods and not to touch it. Uh, Heidi has a question. So what do you do when another company does use your hashtag, for instance, hashtag Fort Mill Bakery, and uses it after being sent a cease and desist letter? Ah, kind of interesting, Heidi. And that one, um, are they using that as a trademark? You know, do they have a domain name? There's certain things you can do. Um, you, if they're trying to use it as a trademark and a file as such, you can actually try to cancel it. Um, there are two new procedures that have just been used. They're ex parte um, that can help trademark owners for it. You may want to sue these guys. It really just depends on what they're like. You know, there being two bakeries, Heidi, I always admonish my clients that if we did a trademark search and we come back someone else through, um, that's similar to us, it's like, hey, oh, yeah, they're trying to use it as a location finder. You know, that sounds specious to me, Heidi. This is a situation to where you would want to be like, hey, this is my trademark. You need to step off this. If you don't step off this, I'm going to report you to the Better Business Bureau. You know, there are a lot of ways we can handle it in a subtle reference without having to go full litigation. But the Business Bureau, I've always found, I served on the BBB board here in Greenville for a long time. You'd be shocked. They are still very, very pertinent with respect to people going to those sites and seeing that you have a bad rating, Heidi, that's a great way to use it and say, look, I want you to step off. This is my trademark. I don't want you using it. I don't want you using Fort Mill Bakery as a location finder. Leave me alone. Don't touch my trademark. Try that first. Heidi, though, I want you to use church language. I do not want screaming. I don't want yelling. I don't want you being my, my little baby on the first slide. I want you to be very professional. I want you to reach out to them cordially and say, hey, please cease using my name. And they can say it's a location finder or whatever else. They don't need to be using it, you know, because if they're trying to indicate where you're at, you can do that fine with your own location. Um, we can always talk about this more off screen, but no, you don't want somebody using your trademarks without your permission. Now, another one, uh, guys, when we move on to the fourth order tiers, use an attorney. And I get it. It's an attorney saying use an attorney. And by gosh, we're expensive. Here's the thing I told Heidi. We're not only expensive, we're there. And unlike a Google document, if you come to somebody and say, hey, I need a South Carolina assignment or I need a South Carolina trademark policy or I need a South Carolina contract, you don't have to worry that we're going to go pull a New York document or a Texas document or a Maine document. What we're going to do is provide a South Carolina, a good old South Khaki document. You will have that. I've um, got one from Hallsville, guys. I'm trying to get to the bottom here. Uh, William Clark. Would trademarks work similarly? with do not compete contracts from subcontractors or former and present employees. Um, well, the trademarks work similarly with do not compete contracts. With, yeah, well, William, nobody should be able to use your trademarks anyway. If they're an employee and they leave, they don't get to use your trademarks. That's not part of it. Um, if I'm answering that correctly, let me know. But yes, if someone leaves your employee, they can't take your trademark and run with it. It's your trademark. We never want them to have permission to do that. It's actually called naked licensing if you were to let third parties use it without your oversight. So we don't want to do that anyway. But no, an employee cannot run off and use your trademark after they've worked for your company. Um, but back to this one, guys, you know, I, just like William had just asked, there are ways that we can make certain that our contracts are favorable to us. Like if he wants to non-compete with his employees, it's going to have to be done under South Carolina law. We can't do it under a New York framework or a Texas framework or a Maine framework. We absolutely can't do it under like a California framework because they don't allow restrictive covenants. So pulling a document off the Internet, guys, you've got no clue where it's from. We don't know if it's valid. We don't know who assigned it. It might have been an eighth grader just typing words. And here we are. Um, jurisdictions may not appreciate it. They may not allow it. Also, assignments, guys, you'll hear this word a lot today. I want you to get your assignments. I want you to make certain that you're uh, the owner of your IP. But what I don't want you to do is to get one that uses bad language. You can go pull one off the Internet. South Carolina is very particular that our assignments must be present tense language. You can't say I promise to assign or I will assign or I'm going to assign or if this happens, I'll assign. It has to be I do hereby assign, yada, yada, yada. Um, another thing, guys, Legal Zoom, Legal Shield, all these joker organizations do not use them. You want an attorney who's close to you or at least somebody that you know has got an office that you can drive to with the baseball bat. 
because what we don't want to have happen is usually these fly by night companies, they're going to charge you a lot of money. It's going to be very, very bougie. You're going to see some things and be impressed with it. They're like, oh my gosh, I've, I've made the right choice. I saw one today at my other presentation from Legal Aid that is now, you open it up and it's this cool little thing that shows a video summary of their application. I'm like, you know what I'd rather have? I'd rather have a good clearance search to show me that, yeah, we're going to get this thing. Not a cool little pamphlet that I can open on the elevator that'll make noise. It's kind of like the upgrade of a Hallmark card. Um, that aggravates me because you don't need these sort of gimmicks to sell a good invention. You need a good patent to sell a good invention. Um, but again, these legal Zoom type entities aren't your friend. They use attorneys who are not in your area. When they're done with you, when that trademark's registered, you know, kind of like Heidi said, they're like, hey, we'll get you registered. You'll be cool, but they're also going to cut you loose. And then at six point uh, five years out, and you haven't paid your fees for your trademark, someone else can file for that trademark and you register on it. And you're like, well, I'll still be using it. That's fine. Well, there's a concept called the fishbowl. And what that means is, let's say Heidi had one at six and a half. We didn't pay the fee at that one. Well, let's say somebody else files one nationally, and then they move into South Carolina or North Carolina, wherever you're located, Heidi, and say, hey, you know, I see that you're in Fort Mill. You're a bakery. That's awesome. Well, I'm now all throughout the state of South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, you're now limited to where you were using it in a common law sense, meaning where you advertise. So guys, I know it sounds like I'm just saying, ah, use an attorney, use an attorney. But if you don't, there's some very bad things that will happen. And I want you to avoid these bad things. Um, another aspect, guys, you heard Kevin talking about trademark applications, patent applications. There are various types of patent applications. One thing I want you to know is they speak a very unique language. It's kind of like that old adage, if you don't surf, you don't start. Um, if you have not done patents on your own or trademarks on your own, I don't advise you to try to do it on your own with your own money. You want an attorney to help you with this stuff. Let's think of it this way. Um, in 2023, we're going to see trademarks reduced to a three-month span. I don't know about you guys. I've got twin 13-year-olds. Three months goes by in about a blink. Uh, six months goes by in about a blink and a half. So we don't want to have any of those problems. Now, you also heard Kevin mention maintenance. And what we mean by that is that for patents, you have to pay money to keep them alive. Now, we talked about how a lot of trademarks die after the six and a half year because people haven't paid those fees. Well, pay, uh, patents actually hit you with a triple threat. You have to pay fees at three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years. Now, for instance, on these fees, and there are three categories, guys, of entities at the USPTO. You have a micro entity, meaning that you make less than a certain threshold of income, and that's both the inventors as well as the company. You have a small entity, meaning you're less than 150 employees, or you have a large entity, meaning that you're greater than 150 employees. At the 3.5 year, a micro would pay 500, a small would pay 1,000, and a large would pay 2,000. So you see that the uh, large entity is paying actually double the small, four times the micro. Um, at the seventh and a half year, these fees go up to 940 for a micro, 1880 for a small, and 3760 for large. At the 11.5 year, they go up yet again. And again, Kevin mentioned the patent process is expensive. Understand these are just the fees that you have to pay. So at 11 and a half years to keep your patent pending at the PTO, a micro entity has to pay 1925, a small entity has to pay 3850. And a, a large entity has to pay $7,700. So if you miss one of these, you're toast. But you also need to sit back and do the business math of, is it worth it for me to keep this alive? If the product is making you money, you're getting good sales on it, you do it. If it is not, you've got the ability to say at the 30 and a half year mark, maybe I pay this and go on for a little bit more. At seven and a half, you're like, this isn't worth it. I'm not paying anymore. Or if you're 11 and a half, this thing's selling like hotcakes. Everybody's wanting to license it. You pay that fee in small, but you have to remember if you miss any of these, if you pay three and a half, seven and a half, you're up to 11 and a half and you don't pay it, your patent's gone, guys. It's now donated to the public domain. Anybody can use it. If Captain or Carolyn or me or Heidi or anybody else on this situation wants to set up a um, business based on that fact, they can do it. Freelo, open to you. Robert, open to you. Any of you guys would be able to go out and say, hey, I'm going to use this lapse patent. You know, Juliana, if you want to set up one or Tanzania or Ross, if you guys want to use a lapse patent in your business, you've got the ability to do that. Now, we don't want to let a patent lapse unless we intend to. So I want us to be very, very conscious that at three and a half, seven and a half, and 11 and a half years, you've got to A, respond to the PTO, and B, pay them. 
If you miss any of those, you will lose your patent. And I'm telling you guys, that's another reason to use an attorney. We use a docketing system. We'll pin you about a year out saying, hey, this fee's coming up. Do you want us to pay it? Let us know. If you're trying to do this on your own, guys, you turn around, somebody's got a toothache, somebody's sick. All of a sudden, you forgot to pay a fee. It's a couple of days later, and you're like, oh, crud, I probably should have done that. Or if you're like me, you won't remember it for like three months down the road and be like, oh, wow, that went south really fast. Another one, guys, self-help. You know, um, by Kevin described patents and trademarks as having some self-help capabilities to it. Be very, very, very cautious in this. Um, you know, Kevin mentioned design patents. I would advise you, if you're good at design patents, do them, man. If you can do it on your own and save that fee, absolutely. But if you send one in that's not right, design patents have a concept called new matter. And if you've got something wrong with the way the shade is or if you need to add something to it, you can get crosswise with an examiner pretty quick. Another thing I want you to be aware of is that our statements about our patents, our statement about our inventions can become prior art. Uh, plus, any patent application we file becomes uh, basically public knowledge 18 months after filing. So I've got a client that makes alcohol-infused ice cream. I have no idea how they do it. They've been a client of mine for close to 15 years. Um, I don't want to know how they make it. And they've actually offered to share it with me. I'm like, I just don't need to know. We're going to protect it as a trade secret. We're not going to put it in a patent because we know after 18 months from our priority date, guess what? This bad boy is going to publish. Everybody and its uncle is going to know what's in this thing. Um, we also want to make certain that, hey, our trademark applications are done to covers. If you're a clothing company, I go as broad as tops and bottoms. It's all I fall for. I don't say tuxedos, I don't say boxer shorts, I don't say tutus, I don't say, you know, three-piece suit ensemble. I say top and bottom is clothing. You can find me some clothing that's not a top or bottom, you win the war. But here's the trick. If you say, I only make three-piece suits, then all of a sudden you start making Hawaiian shirts. At the um, fifth year, they're going to say, hey, you need to provide me a new specimen showing that you're making these three-piece suits. Well, you'll send a picture of the shirt because you're like, I make Hawaiian shirts now. Here's the problem. You told the trademark office that I make three-piece suits, and that was all you put in there. You'll lose your trademark because your specimen will not match what you applied for. Uh, that happens a lot. You'll see companies have this happen. They don't realize that, hey, I was too narrow in my trademark. Sometimes you'll see people are too broad. They'll list 500 things. You know, each distinct class has a fee, so you want to be very careful with what you put in those marks. You want to be very focused on your goods. Um, you also remember in that class, you can list 600 types of clothing, but at the end of the day, the trademark office is going to be like, well, I need 600 specimens because you said you did socks and wife beaters and T-shirts and Oxfords and tuxedos and cummerbunds and all this other stuff. So I need you all to be very, very aware that what you say in these trademark applications does matter. We would preferably go broad that covers your business, but not an inundated list that you're going to be in trouble trying to fulfill in later. Um, one thing, too, you know, we asked about the patent that's been out there and it's got a couple of rejections on it. You know, guys, patents can go uh, at least two and a half spans. I've had patents go three or four spans. And eventually you can get there with a, a examiner. You know, again, sit back, take that real look at it and say, hey, is this patent going to get through? Have a conversation with the examiner. That's the person handling it. That's the best person for you to have a talk with to say, look, am I doing this right? You know, what are my chances of getting this patent? Where are we on this? Have that discussion with the examiner. If you've not done that, that needs to be a post haste. Happens right now, year of our Lord, 2022. Now, here's something else. Everything go boom, folks. Failing to timely file a patent application. Uh, I'm hit with a plethora of reasons. You know, I don't have any money. I'm a young business. You know, there's a lot going on. I'm busy. I'm trying to make sales. Here's the problem. If we go out and we put our invention out there, whether by presenting it a million cups, offering somebody to sell it. Again, we don't even have to be a good salesperson. We can just offer it. Um, we can talk about it. We'll do a video of it. Heck, we'll do a paper down at Clemson on it. If we do any of these activities and put it out in the public, guys, we have one year to be able to file a U.S. patent application. Just one year. Here's the worst problem. We can't file Canada. We can't file Mexico. We can't go to Japan. We can't go to Europe. This device might have been a huge fishing uh, device. And that means we would have liked to have gone not only to the U.S., but Australia and Brazil. Great big fishing markets. But if we went up to a million cups and showed this lure off and talked about how it can catch any fish anywhere, anytime, we, A, waived our foreign rights. They're completely gone. And if we don't have a U.S. application on file in a year, we're going to donate that to the public. Now, one thing, you know, Kevin's talked about cost, guys. 
I appreciate it. You're a small business. These things are expensive and they're slow. There are ways to make it, this work for you. We've got provisional applications. We've got a lesser version of that called a cover sheet provisional. There are a lot of ways that you can get protection on your concept and to get that clock running and to give you time to figure out your R&D. Because what you don't want to have happen is I've had clients come in and say, Doug, want to file a patent? Let me show you this prototype. It works like a champ. I'm like, this is awesome. You can tell me about it. What have you been doing with it? They're like, oh, well, we've been selling it for two and a half years. And I literally had that number thrown at me a few years back about a product. And there's nothing I can do. You know, we can't take a time machine and go back and say, hey, don't sell this. Unfortunately, that product's been out there. It's more than a year. We've lost our foreign rights. There's nothing we can do, guys. I don't want that happening to you. I want you to understand that there are economical ways that we can go about protecting it. You don't have to file a full-blown utility application right out of the gate. We can start the cover sheet provisional. We can start with a full provisional. There are other things we can do that can be done less uh, cost expensive than a full-blown utility. However, you've got to ask, and I want you guys to be very, very careful about posting on the internet, doing videos, doing audio clips, presenting it, you know, writing about it. You can damage your intellectual property very easily with any of those steps. Um, guess what, guys? All of us are small businesses. We want to be able to go out and become a big business. To do that, we're probably going to need an investor. What these investors are going to do is they'll have me or one of my nasty brothers or sisters come to y'all and say, hey, um, tell me about your trademarks. Have you filed them? You know, if you want my money, you've got to show me that you're a good steward of your IP. Have you filed your patents? You know, do you have a utility on this? Do you have a design? You know, Kevin mentioned the plant patent. If you're in the agriculture space, they will want to know, have you filed patents on these new um, breeds of plants? You know, have you registered your copyrights? And that could be such things as house plans. It could be designs. It might be your logo if you've got a particular use for it. Um, ah, I love this. So Prevo is an educated man. He says, can you please mention the PCT process in addition to foreign rights? All right. So guys, realize we do not have anything like a universal patent application. The closest thing we have is called a patent cooperation treaty application. Uh, the reason that you would file a PCT is you think, hey, I'm going to go into multiple foreign countries, that there are enough foreign countries that I would rather go through a PCT application where I will pay one fee and then have some time worked out. The way a PCT works, guys, is you have to ha have it filed within one year of your earliest uh, priority date. And that can be one year from a provisional, can be one year from a utility, um, but you have one year to do it in. PCTs are very expensive. That application costs about $4,500 just for the filing fee. That's not an attorney's fee. That's not any sort of preparing the application fee. That is what you pay the World Intellectual Property Organization to just hold that PCT for you. Now, the good thing about a PCT is you can wait until a year out to file it. So you can say, hey, do I have market share? Am I seeing places that I think this would be good to file in? You can wait for a year to do that, and then you have another 18 months from filing the PCT to decide where to go with it. So, yes, you're paying $4,500, but you're also buying yourself a year and a half before you have to start going into particular countries. Prelo, awesome question. I have clients use PCTs a lot. Very economical system if you're going into multiple countries. If you're doing less than five or six, though, I'll tell you to look going straight into those countries at the year for the national phase. Again, if you're thinking, hey, I don't know which countries I'm going to go into, PCT is a nice option. You know, it's up to a year out. You've got 18 months to figure out which of those countries you want to go into. So time-wise, PCT is a very, very useful concept. Um, you know, back to the money figures, guys. They're going to want to know that you've registered your copyrights. They want to know that you have written contracts with your vendors. Do you have your assignments? You know, have you gotten those assignments? Do I know that the inventors have all assigned to you? You know, I don't have a disgruntled inventor out there someplace whose name is on a patent, who's now a part owner. Um, I had a um, painful conversation a few years back, got a patent allowed after it set at the patent office for about two and a half rounds. I got on horn with the examiner, had an interview with them. I had what I thought was a very good amendment. She agreed and said, hey, we're going to allow your patent. Um, get it allowed. And one of the older attorneys at the firm I used to work at came in and said, hey, can you reach out and get an assignment from the inventors? And y'all, you remember how I told you I like to do assignments at the beginning of a patent application? Well, this is one of the reasons why. I would reached out, and I won't name names, but I had reached out to uh, both inventors. One inventor said, sure, happy to assign. The other inventor said, no way am I assigning. I hate inventor one. We've not spoken in several years. 
To make matters worse, the inventors are a father and a son. The son uh, was like, hey, you know, I'll sign it. I'm uh, still a company. Things are great. He and his dad had had a falling out. They didn't talk anymore. Neither had filed an assignment. And everybody's like, well, you know, hey, you know, this is a work made for hire. Problem is they both own the company. And so now you've got a situation to where you're like, wow, I can't claim work for hire because an owner is not an employee. You know, that is a distinction right there. And it's a critical one at this point. Um, they ended up having to go back and prove that the father had been paid money to essentially um, assign over his rights as part of a sort of a wealth share program and a stock buyout for him. We had to actually file that documentation at it because we couldn't use um, the employee inventor unwilling to sign because he did not have an obligation to assign it to the company. You know, you can, or, you can argue good faith and, hey, you're an owner and you do have these obligations. But here's the problem. This all could have been done about so much easier with just a simple assignment. Single piece of paper that says, me, dad, assigns to company this invention. You do it when we file the assignment. You do it before he and the son no longer speak. And it's not a problem. But guys, a lot to unravel from that story. Always conduct interviews. If you're not talking to that examiner, you're not really prosecuting. You also want to make certain those assignments are done day zero. Uh, my paralegal Laurel gets this stuff before we file. Before we file the application at the PTO, we have print copies and scanned copies of the assignments, and I'm happy as a clam. If I don't have them, we're going to take that inventor off of the application and make certain that we don't use their contribution in any of the claims. That's a really dive, deep dive into that, but there are ways that we can guard against these guys ever being able to say that they had a foothold in the past. Put it in writing, put it in writing, put it in writing. I cannot tell you all enough, guys, so many problems for a small business come from the handshake period. They're like, hey, you know, I, you know, I knew this person. We were doing good. We had a great rapport. We had a handshake. Don't do it. No matter what the agreement is, no matter what it's for, get it in writing. Even if it's just an email, set it out so at least the way you understand it has been presented to the other side. But for assignments, contracts, licenses, non-disclosures, those absolutely religiously have to be writings. Saying a handshake and you're trustworthy, it's not going to work. Um, again, memory fades. Also, guess what? When that value increases, if somebody can come back to it and say, hey, there's a way for me to possibly get more money here, you'll be shocked at how their memory uh, happens to better their position rather than bettering your position. So again, guys, no handshakes, even for the simple stuff. Uh, here's the 10th order. I don't have any intellectual property. You do. Everybody on this call today, if you have a business, if you have any sort of side hustle, if you have anything that you're interested in in that extent, you have trade secrets. Anybody here that has a business that they're currently working in, that business has trade secrets. You know, Heidi asked about her uh, logo early on. Guess what? Heidi has trade secrets. That's just the nature of the beast, guys. We have it. It's out there. It's all good. But what we want to make certain, though, is that we have it protected. Because if we fail to audit it, if we fail to take advantage of all these benefits we've got, of all these ways we can to protect this, we're in trouble. Because if we ever try to sell it, our succession plan, we're going to have somebody haggling with us because we didn't file trademarks, we didn't properly protect our patents, we didn't register our copyrights, we got problems. We didn't properly protect our trade secrets from disclosure. Even the baby companies, guys, everybody has IP. I promise you right now, anybody with even a nascent company has a trademark and trade secrets. I promise you that all my honor as an attorney. I want you all to understand that you have this IP already formulated. Now all we've got to do is to take the right steps to protect it. Now, guys, these tiers, and welcome to our little friend back on slide one, we can avoid them. What we want to do is do an audit. What kind of IP do we own? Let's do a clearance search of our trademarks. Let's do patentability searches before we go too far out. Let's protect it. We want to follow our trademarks. We want to follow our patents. We want to register copyrights. We want to protect our trade secrets. Now, guys, do we follow on everything? We absolutely don't. We're going to have some trademarks that aren't going to take off. We're going to have some inventive concepts that, frankly, are duds. Uh, we're going to have some copyright materials that were just like eh, mediocre, don't really feel that it's a company-dependent item. Now, our trade secrets, though, if it's a trade secret, we want to keep it secret. We want that protected forever. Like Kevin said, it's cheap. You have to do it, though. It's got to be reasonable protections, locked rooms. Uh, limited access, passwords on computers, very common sense stuff that we all probably do at a business or have done in the past without thinking, but now we need to do it for our business. A document, our assignments, our contracts, our licenses, everything's in writing, guys. No handshakes. I don't care how long you've known the vendor. I don't care how much you like each other. 
absolutely positively no handshakes. Put it in mind. You got to maintain them. You know, once we file for these guys, it's not file and forget. That's why we don't use the legal zooms. We don't use the legal shields. We use an attorney who at that five-year mark is going to be, hey, Heidi, you know, do you want us to renew this mark for you? Or, hey, Prelo, you know, we've got a patent coming up here at three and a half years. Do we want to pay that maintenance fee? Also, fending off our third parties, guys, a lot of times you will find somebody like Heidi who's using, you know, hashtag Fort Mill Bakery. You're going to have to go do that. And I realize sometimes it's uncomfortable, but it is your IP. If you don't protect it, no one will. And if you don't protect it, you may lose it due to naked license. And I don't want that happening to you guys. I want y'all to understand that, look, you know, today has been sort of a cautionary tale, but it's a cautionary tale to silver line. We want to be able to understand that we can protect ourselves in all of these situations with some forethought and with the ability to say, hey, there are arsenals here, there are weapons I have that I can take advantage of. Guys, y'all have been awesome. I want more questions. Anybody has a question, chat me, whatever y'all want to do. I'm here to help. So I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Does anyone have any questions for Doug and or Kevin? Okay. Well, as I had mentioned earlier, everyone that we have confirmed their attendance will be receiving a post-event survey probably within the next few minutes um, at the end of this. And then more than likely within about five to seven working days, we will be sending to those that respond the slide decks from each presenter, as well as a link to the recording of the event. Um, so we do have a few things in here, just a thought out loud. If you don't register a trademark, is your logo or other protected under the constitution anyway? You know, great question on that. Guys, let me get in my number and so y'all can get it. And I'm sorry, I keep hitting enter instead of just doing it at one time. I'm not the smartest creature. Uh, that's a really good question. And so think on it. We know that we do have certain forms of it that can be protected via common law. Uh, for instance, we have the ability to have our trademarks uh, pr protected via common law, but here's the problem. Just like we talked about the hiding situation, if she's up in Fort Mill, she's the Fort Mill Bakery, she never registers federally, we have a, let's say there's a Fort Mill in North Dakota. These guys take off, they move into no, uh, North, South Carolina, Georgia. They come to Heidi and say, hey, Heidi, now here's the thing. Yeah, I love the fact you've got your uh, bakery out there. I love the fact you're making this, but I now own the uh, trademark for this. So you, Heidi, can only use it wherever you were previously advertised. You can't use it in Columbia, you can't use it in Greenville, you know, wherever you were advertising before I came into the area is all you'll ever be able to do, and you can never expand beyond that. Um, you know, it's just a big thing to worry about, guys. Uh, copyrights, too. You know, as soon as you, everybody would, just hold up your phone. I'm going to stop sharing and show you all this one. Everybody hold up your phone. Aim it at the screen. You know, pull up your video app, pull up your photograph app, whatever you use, and hit the little button. Literally, I just pushed the button, and I've taken a, a screenshot of all of you beautiful people's names, and that sexy English man, Kevin Ware. I'll show it to you all so you know I did it. Well, of course, now my phone's pushing on, flipping around. But here's the photo that I've taken of all of y'all. Little fuzzy, trying to get the camera to work with me. Right there it is. So guess what, guys? That is a copyright. Now, ignoring that I can see Robert's face and Mike's face and Juliana's lovely face, those, let's ignore those for a second. And what I've done is I have created a copyright. I do have common law protection in that. I can register it federally and get enhanced protections. But here's the thing, to take advantage of attorney's fees and triple damages, got to have it registered. If I'm going to take advantage of the small claims court at uh, copyright office, got to have it registered. So if it's one that I think, hey, this is one of the best pictures of photographer I've ever taken, one of the best house plans I've ever devised, some of the best computer code I've ever written, one of the best sculptors I've ever sculpted, those are the ones to register on. But what we don't want to do, don't overfall. You know, there's no need to give money away, but make a very concerted decision on, are we going to protect our IP? And if so, we go in and we protect what we should. Um, Kevin's got a great question. Can you patent an idea that is close to something that has been abandoned? That is a great question, Kevin. Still under the same concepts you talked about before. Is it novel? And is it not obvious in view of that prior application? 
one way to think about this is it's called a design around. Let's say the patent application is living. We look at it and we say, okay, Kevin's got an existing patent. Mike wants to set one up and he and Robert are business partners and Fred lives in there too. And they're like, okay, we want to set up a company and we want to use a process very similar to the one in Kevin's living patent. What we do is we look at Kevin's claims and then we try to figure out what can we do to eliminate one of those items. And y'all in patents, you have what are called independent claims and dependent claims. Independent claims are a number that doesn't reference anybody else. No, claim number one is always independent. There may be more throughout. But when we look back at Kevin's patent, we want to say, hey, for every independent claim, if he's got five elements in it, we only do one or two or three or four of them. We don't do all five. Uh, that's how we give it around a living patent. Now, if we want to take an abandoned concept and get a patent on it, what we have to do is to look at it and understand, hey, this abandoned patent was already out there. It was already issued as a patent. This technology is in the public. What can we do to improve on it that will allow us to convince a patent examiner, hey, this is new, and in view of that other patent, someone in the field like Mike or Julianne or somebody wouldn't have been like, oh, yeah, it's obvious to paint it red. It's obvious to add this molecule to it. You know, you want that discussion. You're still under that same onus. But, yes, you could look at an expired patent and come up with a new concept and get a further patent off of it. Um, William says, my business is five months young and my income is very tight. I hear you, William. You know, ask your attorneys to work out like a payment plan. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do. I'm always happy to help a small business, but make certain. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. He just asked, do attorneys take monthly payments for future work on issues such as this? Yes. Uh, personally, I'll work with you on a payment plan. I love doing that. I love small businesses. My firm doesn't exactly enjoy it, but man, I'm an equity partner. I can't fire me now. But here's what I tell you, though, is that you want somebody to work with you. You want somebody close to you. It doesn't have to be me, William. Find somebody you like. Find somebody who's going to work with you. But what I'll tell you is this. Make certain that you can get in the car and be there in a few hours. Make certain that they'll pick up a phone and call you when you call them because you don't get that out of LegalZoom. You don't get that out of uh, Legal Shield or any of these fly benign IP companies. Make certain you've got an attorney because I'll tell you a little secret. I have a certain level of kryptonite called the South Carolina Bar. And the South Carolina Bar, if you call them up and say, hey, this Lineberry guy is a freaking joke and I want you all to do something about it, you know what they'll do? They'll do something about it. You know, you can file a complaint. There are things you can do to take care of attorneys who did not take care of you. And I advise you to do that. If you've got an attorney who's non-responsive, who's not doing good work, you know, realize, too, they can be crazy clients, but they're also crazy attorneys. And I want you all to understand that part of your ability, part of your freedom is to pick who your counsel is. That is a huge choice, guys. William, that's a great question. Guys, anything else? Any any IP concept? If I don't know, I'll figure it out for you. Well, I'm hoping that someone is typing. <laughs> awesome. Looking forward to it, William. And y'all, my uh, email and office direct line are both in this. If y'all ever, if you just want to say, hey, I don't feel like chatting about it in front of everybody, feel free to call or email. Always happy to set up a Zoom. A uh, big Zoom fan. I think it's important to get to know your attorney, see what they look like, and you can spot them on a police lineup, see them on TV later, or on the post office wall. That's always critical. But y'all, ask any questions you've got. Happy to do that. If any of y'all want a copy of this, absolutely. Uh, just ask Caroline for it. She should have one. Um, or I can email Kevin and we'll make it all work out. Thank you, Heidi. This was a great presentation. Absolutely. So, uh, y'all make certain Heidi gets one. She asked for a copy of it. Anybody, William, you too. Whoever wants a copy of it, y'all ask, we'll get it to you. So again, um, I'll be sending out the post-event survey. So those individuals that respond to the post-event survey, it's just a few questions, shouldn't take you but a few minutes. I'll be sending that after the close of the event. Um, when you respond to that, we will be sending out slide decks from both presenters. That would be Kevin Weir and Doug Library, as well as a link to the recording. Now, it may take us five to seven days to get that recording posted to YouTube, but I will be sending that out out once that is done. Does anyone else have any questions for Doug and or Kevin? Well, if not, we are going to conclude the presentation today. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you everyone for attending. Have a good afternoon. Everybody have a good one. Bye. See you guys.